It's good to be with you, church. For those of you that are new or visiting, my name is Halim Sa. I serve as one of the pastors and elders here at the Stone. Last week, we started our series in the book of Exodus. And as Matt shared, we're going to be talking about the subject of abortion today. And we're going to be looking at particularly all the ways of how the infanticide that was happening in the book of Exodus is analogous to the abortion that's happening today. With the release of the undercover videos from the Center for Medical Progress revealing the selling of fetal body parts by Planned Parenthood, this issue of abortion has come to the forefront, forefront of our attention. And as I watched some of these videos, it took me back to when I was in college at Texas A&M, just normal day, normal day, walking from class to class, walking across the campus, and there in front of the MSC were set up these just giant pictures of aborted babies. Just middle of the campus, set up just giant pictures of aborted babies all around. And of course, I had known about abortion for years, but I had never been confronted with it like that in such graphic detail. And I just froze right where I stood and I just wept. Such feelings of hopelessness, such feelings of helplessness, feeling like I should do something, right? But do what? I didn't know. So I just stood there and I cried and, and I prayed. I knew some of the numbers, some of the stats. The numbers today are 58 million babies in the United States have been aborted and killed since 1973's Roe v. Wade. 1.4 billion babies worldwide. But these numbers, even as we hear it right now, like we could have some grasp of it in our minds, but they don't quite make it down into our hearts, does it? But when I saw the pictures of these little ones with their limbs torn apart with their little heads crushed, the beautiful knitting of God that has been short, cut short, that's when it made it down into my heart. That's when it became real. And I think for all of us, we need to have that moment when the horror of abortion, it becomes real to us, not just numbers and statistics that we know in our brains and we've tucked away as something, yeah, I know that's something bad that's happening in this world, but something that we see and feel as real. I think all of us need to have that moment. As I watched these videos, all those same feelings kind of came back, feelings of hopelessness, feelings of helplessness, feeling like there was nothing significant that I could do, right? If I could change the law, I would change it right now, but I can't. I felt like there was nothing significant that I could do. I don't know if you relate with that, but is that true, church? Is that true? We as God's people, as God's church, is there really nothing significant that we can do? No, it's not true. As we look at Exodus 1 and 2 today, we're going to be seeing all the ways of how God is calling us to act in the midst of such horrific injustice and darkness. And as we look at the gospel as a whole, we're also going to see that there is no sin beyond God's forgiveness. I need you to hear that. There's no sin beyond God's forgiveness. There's no sin beyond God's grace. Anytime God reveals sin in our lives, it's painful, right? Anytime God so painfully reveals the sins in the hearts of his people, us, it's, it's painful. It's painful. But the reason why he does it, it's never for the purpose of condemnation. It's always for the purpose of restoration. That's why he does it. It's painful, but it's good because he's desiring to restore us. When God reveals the greatness of our sin, it's because he wants to reveal the greatness of our Savior who paid for those sins, who died for those sins. And so whether you're here and you're the mother who had the abortion, or you're the boyfriend who encouraged the abortion, or whether you're here and you've been apathetic and you've been taking the stance of hear no evil, see no evil. Or whether you're here and you've been judging and condemning people rather than pointing people to the forgiveness and grace that could be found in Jesus, we're all guilty. We all find ourselves guilty in one way or another and we need to repent. 
but always, always in repentance, we find the God who is not standing there with his arms crossed, but we find the God who is already looking off in the distance for us, and at even the slightest hint of turning in repentance, he runs after us, he embraces us with his grace, he clothes us with his righteousness. And that's what I've been praying for all week this week, that God would do the work of revealing our sins revealing them as utterly sinful so that we could have a greater view of Jesus than we ever had before. Seeing our sins as they truly are so that we can see Jesus as he truly is. For God's people, these videos ought not to be revealing some new information that is now just somehow, now making all of this unacceptable. It's always been unacceptable. But I do think that God is using this moment in time, that God is using what's happening in the world today to grab a hold of his church, to shake us, to wake us up, to make what's happening real to us, to make it real to us. He's calling us to repent, to experience God's grace so that we can go and act and point people to this grace that God offers us. And so let's go to the text, Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 15. Well, here's another point in human history when the systematic killing of babies was being employed. As we talked about last week, the Pharaoh who did not know Joseph and all that he did to contribute to the prosperity and the wealth of Egypt has come into power. And he's increasingly suspicious and even pathologically nervous about this population of people that's growing in his land and and he first tried to employ the policy of persecution through slavery, right? That's what we talked about last week. First he tried to employ slavery, try to persecute, to try to oppress. But the Bible says the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. And so now what is he going to do? Now he's going to employ ethnic cleansing and infanticide. Genesis 1, 15. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew wife, midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. The first thing I want us to see in this text is that subtle infanticide, it progressed to open infanticide. Subtle infanticide, it progressed to open infanticide. In other words, Pharaoh didn't start off by saying, everyone, everyone, go out there and kill all the Hebrew baby boys. That's not how he started. That's where he ended, but that's not how he started. First, he tried to employ the killing of these babies through subtlety, through secret treachery and silence. Why do I say that? Because he first told the Hebrew midwives to kill the babies, right? Why the midwives? Because the midwives were in a special position to be able to deliver the baby. Some commentators even believe that they were being asked to perform partial birth abortion, that as soon as the baby was, be, was delivered enough for them to be able to discern if it was a boy, that they would choke and kill the baby and then present the baby as a stillborn to their mother and father. But the midwives didn't obey Pharaoh. Why didn't they obey? Verse 17 tells us, because they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. And we'll talk more about these wonderful midwives later. So when the subtle infanticide didn't work, what did Pharaoh progress to? Well, verse 22 tells us, then Pharaoh commanded all his people, right? 
Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, not just the midwives, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. And so subtle infanticide, it progressed to open infanticide. What's the warning that we ought to be hearing loud and clear in this text? What this text should teach us is that we should not be so foolish and naive to think that the killing will only and always be limited to the unborn. We should not be so naive and foolish to think that the killing will only and always be limited to the unborn. Genesis 6, 5 says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What Genesis 6 is showing us is that there's an evil in our hearts apart from God's grace will always want to increase, it will always want to progress continually. And so just as the evil of the, of the subtle infanticide, it progressed and increased into open infanticide and exodus, let us not be so foolish and naive to think that the killing will only and always be limited to the unborn. God's people have always held to the biblical teaching, the biblical truth, that the value of a person's life, that the value of a person's worth and their dignity is not found in their abilities or their capacity, but simply and solely rooted and based upon the fact that they are created in God's image. That's the biblical truth that we have held on to. But what happens in a society that once rooted the basis for human rights and the belief that all people are created in the image of God now shifts away from believing in God at all. What happens to a society like that? If more and more of our society and the people we elect to write laws don't believe in the image of God anymore as the reason for why human beings are worthy of rights and therefore protection, well, they have to root it in something else, right? What is that something else? And that's what's happening. They are rooting human rights in what they call capacities. The capacity to reason. The capacity to make decisions. The capacity to have what some people call preferences. And this is the reason why the Supreme Court determined that abortion should be legal, because the life in the womb doesn't have capacities. They can't make choices. They can't reason. They don't know right from wrong. They can't live apart from the mother. They are completely dependent. They don't have capacities. Therefore, they don't have rights. And this is what Pastor Tim Keller says about this. If that's true, let's keep something in mind. Born infants don't have those capacities either. They can't reason. They have no preferences yet. They can't make moral choices, and neither can senile old people and neither can ver the very mentally handicapped human beings. Therefore, none of them, if you believe abortion is all right, then you really can't protect the rights of any of these other people because their rights are based upon their capacities. If you don't believe in the image of God, what are you going to do? What are you going to ground human rights in? When you ground it in capacities, if you can't protect the unborn, you can't protect the newly born, you can't protect the mentally handicapped, and you can't protect old people. It's a fact that's logical. When you believe in the image of God, the circle of protected life, it expands. But if you don't believe in the image of God, if you only believe in capacities or some other trumped up approach to why we believe in human rights, the circle will continually contract, get smaller and smaller, and fewer and fewer people will be protected. Now, my point isn't to scare you and say, if you don't protect the unborn, then sooner or later, they're going to come for you and your children and their grandparents. That's not my point at all. My point is that the progression of sin, the evil in men's hearts, ultimately show what all of this abortion is all about. This issue of abortion is ultimately about God. It's ultimately about God. It's an attack on God and his most prized his most precious creation, human beings who he has created in God's image. This isn't primarily a social justice issue, though it is a social justice issue. This isn't primarily a woman's issue. 
This isn't primarily a children's issue. This isn't primarily a humanitarian issue. Over and above all that, greater than all that, this is a God issue. And because this is a God issue, we as God's people, as God's church, we have to deeply and fervently care. We have to care. We can't be apathetic. That's step one. We ask the question, what can we do? Well, we have to care. We have to deeply care. We can't be apathetic. Apathetic, being apathetic is not an option. So then the next question is, how should we care? In what ways can we as God's people care? In chapter 2, what we're going to see is that under the threat of infanticide and genocide, God is going to provide the way of salvation and rescue through a group of women. Through a group of women. He used the midwives. He's going to use Moses' mother. He's going to use Moses' sister. And he's even going to use Pharaoh's daughter. I'd like for us to go through the role of each of these women to give us application into how we need to care and act. But before we do, I want us to notice here first off the special calling of women in the fight against infanticide there in Exodus. And I believe the special calling of women that God is placing upon the women in his church, the women in this room in the fight against abortion in the world today. By no means are men exempt. There's plenty of things that God is calling men to do. But I do believe that particularly in this fight, there's an influence and a spiritual power that women are able to bring that men simply cannot. About a month ago, I was at a local Planned Parenthood um, joining other believers in prayer and protest. And, and there was a certain level of adequacy or, or an inadequacy, I should say, that I felt just being there as a man, just as a dude, um, compared to and contrast to the women that were there, uh, many of them with their children, sharing stories of how God has forgiven them and healed them of their past abortions and, and how they are ministering to other women who are contemplating abortion. It, it was powerful. It was powerful. And I imagined if a woman were to show up to that Planned Parenthood contemplating abortion and if they saw me on the sidewalk saying, hey, will you come speak with me? How much willing she would be versus if a woman were to be on that sidewalk saying, hey, can I share my story with you? Will you speak with me? How much more willing she would be? I do believe that in the story back then in Exodus and in the world today, there is a special calling that God is placing upon women. And I do believe that no woman, no daughter of God is disqualified. If you're here and you've had an abortion, you're not disqualified. If you've had an abortion, you are not disqualified. In fact, you have such a greater opportunity, right? Such a greater story to, to share and ministering to the women that are contemplating abortion. And precisely because of that, precisely because of the possible spiritual power and influence that you can bring, the enemy is going to work especially hard to keep you silent, to keep you quiet. How? By bombarding you with shame and with guilt. And many of you know what that's like. Maybe it's something that happened last week. Maybe it's something that happened years ago. And the enemy has convinced you that the best way of handling all of this is by keeping quiet, that by keeping it a secret. Maybe only a select few know. Maybe no one knows. David said in Psalm 32, verse 3, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. And some of you know exactly what that's like. You feel like your bones are wasting away. You feel like you're groaning all day long. And some of you know that if you've been carrying this burden in a secret for years, it just destroys you. And I know that God wants to set you free. I know he wants to set you free. And if there are those within the church that has kept you from feeling like this is something you could share, if there are those within God's church that has made you feel like this is something you have to keep to yourself, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Church, I think we need to do some self-examination here. Is it possible that by your judging thoughts, 
that by your judging words, saying things like, oh, I could never, saying things like, oh, how could a woman ever, that you are keeping the daughters of God, your sisters in Christ from experiencing forgiveness, redemption, restoration that Jesus has purchased for them at the cross? Is it possible that you're keeping people from experiencing that? If you're saying I could never, you're wrong. You're wrong, we already have, we're all guilty. If you're in God's church, every single one of us, we're all guilty of killing the truly innocent child. Except this wasn't just any child, he was the son of God. And you and I killed him. With our sins, we crucified him. But how did God respond? Not with condemnation, not with judgment, but with forgiveness, with grace, with an embrace. So let us never be a people that say, I could never. Let us never be a people who keep women from experiencing redemption and forgiveness with our judging words and thoughts. And so my sisters in Christ, if you're here and you've had an abortion, God, God forgives you. He forgives you. How do I know? Because I killed his son. Because I killed his son and he forgave me. He, he forgave me and offered me grace. That's how I know. And so you don't have to keep it a secret anymore. You don't have to carry the burden anymore. You could talk to somebody, somebody in your missional community. You could talk to your campus pastor. You could talk to one of the elders and experience the comfort that God is going to give you. Experience the comfort that God is going to give you. What you did, it can't be reversed. It can't be reversed. But because of Jesus, it has been forgiven. It has already been paid for. And then once you've been forgiven, go and comfort others with the comfort with which you've been forgiven. Right? Don't keep it to yourself anymore. Now let's go through the text and see how we can get application from all the women that God used to rescue Israel from this genocide. First, let's look at Moses' mother, Exodus chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. There's a spectrum of things that a woman contemplating abortion is going to be thinking about. All the way from mere inconvenience, right, to truly feeling like there's no other option for, but abortion. We see here in mother, Moses' mother a prime example of a woman who is at the very least experiencing inconvenience, but more realistically speaking, she is experiencing the threat of death upon her life if she would keep this baby. But under the threat of death even, verse 2 tells us that she conceived and she bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child or a beautiful child, other translations say, she hid him for three months. This is a picture, this picture of, of a mother hiding her baby. If you think about it, it's such a beautiful picture. Why did she hide him? Well, in order to protect him, right? When a child is, is in his or her infancy, what does the mother mostly do with her child? When our kids were babies and I was at work, I never wondered where our kids were, where our babies were. I knew they were always with Angela. She was either feeding them, changing them, clothing them, rocking them to sleep, always with our kids, right? A child in their infancy is when they need the most protection, when they need the most nurturing and care. You keep the child close to you and next to you because they're so vulnerable, they're so weak, they're so dependent. And then the more they grow up, more self-sufficient they become, you're able to let them out of your sight, out of the house and into the world. But what about the child at their embryonic stage? 
What about the child at their embryonic stage? In God's infinite wisdom, he saw it fitting to place the baby while they're in their most vulnerable stage, while they're in their most dependent stage. He saw it fitting to place them not just next to the mother, not just near the mother, but in the mother, inside the mother. But in the brokenness and fallenness of the world today, the place in which God has determined to be the safest place in all the world for a baby to be, it has become the most dangerous place. If you're here and you're pregnant and you find yourself contemplating abortion, have the courage, have the courage that Moses' mother did, even at the risk of inconvenience, at the risk of possible death, she saw that the baby was beautiful and she hid him from harm, she protected him. And now what the Bible is not saying is that there aren't any legitimate circumstances that might force a mother to give up her child. Verse three, when she could hide him no longer, when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with the bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. There came a time when she could hide him no longer. So what did she do? Well, she still chose life didn't she? The edict of Pharaoh was to throw the baby into the Nile to die, but what did she do? She did place the baby in the Nile, didn't she? But she created the best possible situation for the baby to be able to live. The writer of Exodus, who happens to be Moses, right, this baby grown up, he portrays the intense care with which the basket was prepared to prevent its leaking. The basket even had a top. It doesn't mean that you have to have all the answers. Moses' mother certainly didn't. She didn't know what was going to happen, but she knew this for sure. She knew this for sure, that she was not going to choose death. She knew that for sure. Next, we see the role of Moses' sister, Miriam, and Pharaoh's daughter. Verse four. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant women, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Such a wonderful story, right? Let's look at Miriam first. Miriam comes into the story and she's not the mother. She's not in the position of having to decide the fate of this child, but she's relationally, she's in proximity to the person who is in crisis. What is she doing? She's watchful, right? She's watching, she's creative, she's inventive, she's opportunistic, she's available, she's faithful, she's an advocate. And so Miriam represents the role that most of us can play. Most of us may never be in the position of having to decide or contemplate abortion, but most of us, if not all of us, need to be in a relationship with the women who do find themselves in that position. There has to be a proximity there. This may mean that we have to get out of our little community of people that look like us and talk like us and act like us. Luke 7, 34 says, the son of man, Jesus has come eating and drinking and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus was, Jesus was hanging out with tax collectors and sinners all the time. To play the role of Miriam in this world, it might mean that we have to start talking with, hanging out with, having lunch with, going to the houses of people that we would have never come in contact with before and to do it not in a demeaning kind of way, to do it not in a pitying kind of way, but doing it in a way where it conveys to others that you are friends, that you are genuine friends because you are. That's what they accuse Jesus of. 
And then we have Pharaoh's daughter. When out of the core of the genocidal royal family came this precious person, tender-hearted princess. Her father could apparently without pity consign sons to the Nile and daughters to slavery, but his own daughter had not inherited his personality. She had a maternal heart Eyes easily move to tears. What can we learn from her? Who does she represent? Pharaoh's daughter represents someone in a position of power. She represents someone who did have influence. She represents someone who had the means to protect life. College students, this might be you one day if you choose to pursue a career in politics and write and change laws. We all have this responsibility to one degree or another in the way that we vote, right? She could represent individuals or families who have the resources to be able to give and fund crisis pregnancy centers. If you feel like you're one of these people, I'd recommend giving to Austin Life Care. You can check them out, austinlifecare.com. Pharaoh's daughter obviously also is a representative of adoptive families, right? We need to see here that God is weaving a story. You might be in the position of the mother in this room. There are options. You might not think so, but even if circumstances are so bad that you have to give up the baby, by choosing life, you do something incredible, not just for your baby, but for adoptive families. Angela and I are in the middle of adopting right now. And when we were given the story of the birth mother of the little boy that we're adopting, and we read it, it was just gut-wrenching. Just so sad, so broken, this, such stories of, of abuse. And if she would have chosen to abort, nobody would have known. And the very few people that would have known, I don't think would have blamed her. But she acted courageously and she chose life and decided to give up her child to adoption instead. Well, meanwhile, on the other side of the world, the Lord was do something. Lord was doing something. He, he was working in my heart. He was working in Angela's heart, heart for some reason. We had always felt this call to adopt, but adopt from where? Adopt who? We didn't know. I think the question that's always asked to people that have adopted is, how did you know this child was the child you're supposed to adopt, right? And the answer that I felt like I've always heard was, we just knew. We just knew. And now that's our answer. We just knew, we saw this story, such brokenness, such sadness. We saw this baby, we just knew he was our child. And so some of you, maybe God's calling you to play the role of Pharaoh's daughter. And all the while we have Shifra and Pua, the midwives that feared God more than Pharaoh and refused to kill the babies at great risk to themselves. Shifra and Pua, I know their names sound funny to us, but Shifra means beautiful one, and Pua means splendid one. And truly, they were beautiful and splendid in God's sight, and what they did was beautiful and splendid. God used Shifra and Pua to save and rescue babies' lives. They were the first pro-life heroines in the Bible, and we need to learn from them, and we need to imitate them. We need to be involved in the pro-life movement redemptively, not accusingly redemptively, not accusingly, Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man, Jesus, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's exactly what these women did. They served at great risk to their own lives. They served. Pastor John Piper said in one of his Sanctity of Life messages that the only thing that will ever compel the heart of America is our suffering not our feistiness, our suffering, not our feistiness. Not that we have a clever comeback to everything and use our pro-life arguments as an opportunity to display our self-righteousness and to show how sinful people are by not agreeing with us. I see some of the ways that so-called Christians argue, read and hear the things that we say and it, and it just crushes me. Being feisty will never work. It will always increase the alienation. But if we lay our lives down, that's what Jesus did, right? But if we lay our lives down, if there are tears on our faces, if we are willing to sacrifice, take some of these women and children into our homes, and if we don't return evil for evil, 
then they just might. Then they just might soften. You know, we look back at all the horrific injustices of the past, things like the Holocaust, things like slavery, things like racial segregation. And we all imagine, I know I do, we, we all imagine that as God's people, if we were to have lived back then, right, that we would have been the ones taking in the Jewish families into our homes. That we would have been the ones running the underground railroads. That we would have been the ones marching at Selma. Well, church, now here's our chance. Here's our chance. And we face quite possibly the greatest injustice that the world has ever known. 58 million unborn baby lives in the United States. 1.4 billion babies worldwide. Do you hear a clear sense of call from God? Is God calling you to be a courageous mother like Moses' mother and choose life? Is God calling you to be a Miriam, a faithful advocate, a counselor to young and scared pregnant women even? Is God calling you to be like Pharaoh's daughter, to give, to influence, to adopt? Well, I know he's calling all of us to be like Shifra and Pua, who did the beautiful thing, who did the splendid thing by pointing us to Jesus. He didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many with meekness and humility, not arrogance. There's no room for arrogance in this fight. With long suffering, not feistiness. Feistiness is unacceptable in this fight. He came to rescue, he came to save. And this is the beauty of Jesus. As great as these women were, right? As great as these women were, none of them could deliver the strangled babies. As great as these women were, none of them could deliver the babies thrown into the Nile. But Jesus, Jesus can deliver the aborted babies. Jesus can deliver the aborted babies. Jesus can deliver and save the, the abortion doctors. He can deliver and save the loudest of abortion advocates. If you don't think that's possible, or if you don't want that to happen, you're believing in the wrong gospel. You're believing in the wrong gospel. Jesus is able to deliver the mothers. Jesus is able to deliver the abortion providers. Jesus is able to deliver the irresponsible boyfriends. Jesus is able to deliver the apathetic. He's able to deliver the self-righteous judgmental. He's able to save. He loves to save every sinner that turns and places all their trust in him. All of us find ourselves guilty. We're all guilty of killing and murdering the truly innocent son. And when God reveals this truth to us, when God reveals this sin to us, it's, it's painful. But he desires for us to see our sins the way they truly are so that we could see Jesus the way he truly is. And when we see our sins the way they truly are, we will find that Jesus is greater than we ever thought. We will see that he's more forgiving than we ever hoped. We'll see that he's more gracious than we ever believed. We'll see that he's more beautiful than we ever dared to dream. Let's pray together. Father, we, we stand before you guilty. Lord, if you count iniquity, who can stand? And so we see that our iniquities were not counted against us. They were counted against the innocent one, the truly innocent one. They were counted against the guiltless one. They were counted against the one who had never known sin, yet for our sake he became sin so that we might by him become your righteousness. Father, will you wake us up? Will you make this injustice crisis real to us? Not just data that exists in our brains, Lord, but help us to feel for every human soul 
created in your image lost, help us to feel it. Help us to see as you see, feel as you feel. And let us not come to this world judging, condemning with our self-righteousness, but just as your son came into this world, not to be served, but to serve and to lay his life down as a ransom for many, let us be willing to lay our lives down. Use us, Father. Bring life. Point people to Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray.